Good evening from the Philippines. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are right now. Thank you for tuning in to this important discussion. This is going to be a very casual conversation, informal discussion, and we want to talk about how young people basically are being affected and are responding in the context of uh, the COVID-19 and how they're responding to addressing food and nutrition security. And with that, we have very lively and we're hoping for a very lively and interactive discussion with you guys here tonight in this very call, in this very meeting, rather. So this is the YPARD eForum, hashtag youth in ag post COVID eForum. All right. We have three wonderful guests with us. This show is a, actually a, a fruit of different organizations collaborating with each other. And we'd like to thank Dream Agritech Consultancy Services for providing us with the technical, uh, back, uh, technical platform for us to make this webinar, this web discussion, this e-forum possible. And this is organized by YPART Philippines and we have YPART Global and YFARM presenting this with us. So, without any further ado, let's go right into what this discussion is all about. The, the discussion that we're going to tackle tonight is basically something about all of us that has affected us, something about the COVID-19. And the COVID-19 pandemic is pushing global agri-food systems to change in various ways. All actors across agricultural value chains, from public to private to civil society sectors, are responding and are being affected to the changes that the global pandemic has brought about in terms of food and nutrition security. Um, in one of the discussions of the United Nations Committee on World Food Security 
the chair of the high level panel of experts said that certain supply chains that were thought to be efficient are now being revealed as not resilient given the context of the health crisis or the global pandemic. And one aspect that we also need to consider about supply chains is the aspect of young people being in this in those supply chains, being that young people actually put a put the sustainability and resilience um, aspect also in the agricultural supply chains, which is why we're brought to this discussion. This discussion, therefore, seeks to kind of highlight and try to map out what the way forward is for youth in agricultural dynamics post COVID-19. So let's introduce our speakers and let, let's not waste time in bringing in this interactive discussion on the go. Let's start off with our first speaker who would like to who we'd like to bring into the show. We have the chair of the YPARD steering committee. She has been in the international community and community and networks um, space for 10 years. She served as the YPARD Global Communications and Knowledge Manager back in 2011 to 2017. She was the Members Engagement Specialist at Civicus, the Global Civil Society Alliance from 2017 to 2019. She fell in the world of agriculture when she was a kid, living in the countryside with her family, working on different aspects of agriculture, from farming, dairy production, extension services, etc. She has a master's in ICT4D from the University of Manchester, and she also has a master's degree in information and documentation sciences from France. Let's welcome to the screen and to the stage, Marina Cherbonnier. Hey, Marina. Hi, guys. Nice to be here. Bonjour. <laughs> nice. I can do that in Filipino, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, Marina, thanks for being on the show and thanks for joining us. All right, let's welcome, so that we have all the speakers here with us, let's welcome our next speaker. We have, he's known to be Agriman. He's the founder of Y Farm, which is We Help You dash TH, so youth. Farm, well, Y Farm, and it's a globally recognized award winning nonprofit organization that pioneers agricultural education entertainment, also known as Agri Edutainment. That's interesting. Its mission is to promote the importance of sustainable agriculture among youth and children, build their capacity in agricultural entrepreneurship, and empower them to contribute to achieving global food and nutrition security. Alpha is globally known as a farmer entrepreneur or a farmerpreneur. He's a motivational speaker. He's an agri youth advocate, and he's a graduate of the University of the West Indies. So Alpha developed Agriman and Photosynthesista. Okay, and he says it very nicely. You'll hear it from him later. The world's first food and nutrition security superheroes. They teach the youth how and why food and farming is critical. And while developing the understanding and motivation and commitment to the said values. Let's welcome to the stage and screen, Alpha Senan. Hey, Alpha. Woo! <laughs> I agree, man. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Jim. Um, thank How you are you doing? Having me. Good morning, Alpha. Good evening, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nice to have you here on the screen yeah. with us from two different sides of the world. I know, right? Thank you. <laughs> All right. Last but not the least, we have the guy, the man behind the steering wheel of YPARD, the global director. For a decade, Yemi's experience has cut across management of multi-stakeholder initiatives, including youth programs, 
and interdisciplinary research activities that focus on the sections of power, people and spaces in landscapes, such as forests, water, and agrosystems, and the, the governance thereof. His portfolio covers experiences in Africa, in Europe, in America, Asia and the Pacific, well, basically the world. And uh, Yemi holds a PhD in multi-scalar and participatory aspects of resource governance from the University of British Columbia in Canada. So let's welcome to the screen our one, our only, YPART Global Director, Yemi. Hello, Yemi. Yemi, you're on the screen. <laughs> hey, Jim. hey, Yemi. Hey, everybody. Hello. I, I, I can't call me like Y from, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> great, great. So thank yeah. you guys for, for agreeing hey, to be on this discussion. Yeah. How are you guys today? Wonderful. Yeah, really feeling really good. Feeling really good. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> very well. It, it's sunny outside, and uh, excellent. Today has been a sort of a talking day for me. This is my second webinar. <laughs> nice. So at least, at least the the previous one got you warmed up already. Uh huh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So we got you very hot from the pan. Mm -hmm. Hello. So we before we jump into the, the discussion and all, we want to see who's greeting us from where. And we have the Wipart Bangladesh country representative, Azam, bringing a shout out. Hey, Azam. Hi, um, nice to hi, see you man. here. We have Munir, Hinai. I think Alpha, he knows you too. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Walaikum salam. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, and... We have a common friend here, yeah, Josine. Yeah. Hey, Josine. Hi, Jax. How are you doing? So we have lots of people watching. Wow. How many viewers do we have so far? Uh, okay. We have a number of people. Great. So, guys, this web discussion is basically not a very formal conference whatsoever. It's very chill informal we want to keep it live we want to keep it interactive so you can interact with us with the speakers as well by jumping in on the discussions if we're tackling a certain point or whatever you can jump into the comments put your ideas in we have our dream agritech uh partner here backstage um dax is in the background who's controlling the backstage like keeping us from the outside and back in. And we have Dax monitoring the comments also. So shout out to Dream Agritech for putting the platform that helped Wipard put this forum together. Great. Good one. So we have, oh, hello, Wakar from Pakistan. I remember seeing Wakar from, from a meeting in Wipard, uh, Asia Pacific in China. That, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have Daniela Rivas. Hey, Daniela, how are you? Great. We have Arif Khan. Hello. We have Arif. How are you, Arif? Doing good. Rebecca Duco. Good morning. Good Hi, morning Rebecca. to you. She's in Trinidad. Good. Nice. We've got people from Trinidad and Tobago. Great. So we have people from around the world listening in. Um, and I think this is a good time to start. We got the people warmed up and ready. They're interacting. I hope you guys keep on commenting. And once we get into the discussions, um, everybody we've mentioned as much as possible, we're expecting you to actually comment as well and share your ideas, share your brilliant stuff. It's not just Marina, Yemi, and Alpha, and me, or Dax that has the brilliant ideas whatsoever. This is basically a space for everybody to interact. So no one is here to monopolize information. It's here for us to share 
with each other and see how we can help together, help each other rather, move forward past this global pandemic. Great. So, are you guys ready? Yeah. <laughs> I don't mean, I don't say that in a way to scare you guys. <laughs> Let's get started. Let's get started. Oh, we have somebody from <clears throat> El Hanati from Mustafa from Morocco. The topic is hashtag Ooh. youth in <laughs> agriculture post COVID-19. So we're going to talk about how young people will, can move forward in the context of the new normal. What people are saying, the new normal, right? Great. So if you guys want to tweet about this event, don't forget to use the hashtag, hashtag youth in ag post COVID. You want to share this stream, please share this stream with your networks. Make sure everybody that you share it with, you tell them that they can interact with us on the comments. We will be featuring them on the screen. We're going to shout out to them wherever they are from the world. And yeah. we're open to everybody's thoughts and ideas and contributions. Woohoo! Okay, Dax. So we got Dax <laughs> commenting and him posting it himself. Nice one, Dax. <laughs> Anyway, that, that's our technical director right there, Dakila Ofindo. So huge shout out to Dream Agritech for putting this, helping us put this up. Great. We've now introduced everybody. We've talked about what this discussion is going to be, what it's all about. Now let's jump in to the very first question. And it's, it, seems, it seems heavy. It seems formal. It seems very technical, quote unquote. But let's try to keep it light in how we treat it, maybe. And more of more of a story, narrative, experiential kind of uh, say or way of answering in terms of you know what what do we what do we've done? So oh, did Yemi just drop off from the the call? I hope not. I confirm he he, he oh, just no. dropped. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Let's hope he comes. Dax, back. could you can you work with Yemi on the backstage to see how he can get back here? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dax. <laughs> All right. So we <laughs> he's just running so we've away. Had technical... <laughs> we have he technical. We have technical. Okay. Time. He's back. He's back. Great. 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 Now he's back. All right. Hey, Yemi. Yemi, I, I got you. Just, <laughs> just when we started, we were about to start the discussion. You drop out like that. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was Dax punishing me. <laughs> no, don't tell me like that. Don't tell me like that. <laughs> I got to leave, right. you to, leave you to it. <laughs> so you see, guys, this is a very informal discussion, really. It's just us wanting to see how we can move forward. All right. So let's tackle the first question. Yemi, please don't drop out on us. <laughs> I will not. I'll stick around. All right. All right. Okay. So for you as a young person or in, in the community that you're in, you're living in, you're engaged with, um, how has COVID-19 impacted you in terms of food and nutrition security? I think the way for us to say maybe food and nutrition security is your access um, in terms of movement restrictions, or is it also, has it affected the availability of certain food items that you were maybe used to buying or whatsoever? Uh, and, and has it also affected the affordability or you know the prices? What is the status from your side of the world in terms of these food access, food availability, and food accessibility. Sorry, food affordability. Yeah. So, who wants to go first? I don't mind. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Alpha. Shoot. Yeah. So, I mean, on my end, um, well, you know, speaking from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, for those of you all who don't know, in the West Indies. Um, the COVID-19 situation has really, well, it, it definitely impacted our food and nutrition security. Um, and from my spectrum, from my angle of the lens, I think in a positive way. And why I say in a positive way is because, as we say, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is grabbing onto some seeds grabbing onto some seedlings, grabbing onto some soil, and planting something, right? Mm. When 
when we first, you know, started hearing that it's, 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 I guess it's coming to the Caribbean and, and you know, there are cases popping up um, in Trinidad and Tobago in particular, the panic obviously started about food, 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 mm -hmm. right? And I, I like to say that it actually, this situation, this pandemic really helped our cause at Y Farm in a sense, you know, in a, mm -hmm. in a weird sense, of course, you know, because it's unfortunate. But it really helped us answer that question, why farm, which we were trying to get across to our, um, to our followers all these years, right? And it sort of then tipped those followers over the edge to really know, okay, let me plan something. It's, it's real. It's serious. There's a crisis. I could possibly go hungry. And with all the money in your pocket and all the assets you may own, if you don't have that kitchen garden, you could be in problems. Mm. So, so that is where it really impacted. And then our, my goal or our goal at Y Farm now is to really keep people and to keep them planting, keep them growing that, their own food. And, um, and you know, so we, we, we came up with several initiatives to, to be able to do this. And I guess I could go into it a little later, you know, how we plan to keep these folks planting, how we plan to keep them um, being backyard garden, gardeners, you know. So, yeah. Wow. So in your context, basically what happened is the, the, the pandemic somehow put everybody questioning. Yeah. Why farm? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 people get that answer. You know, they, they got that answer that this is why farm. You know, there's a, national, there's a global crisis. You know, the barrier yeah. will be shut. Me not be able to import food. Um, besides sure. that, even I didn't mention as well that fast food restaurants were closed, you know, mm. so folks were now forced to go back to their kitchen, go back to getting yeah. all these vegetables, you know, local vegetables that they may have been running away from all the time mm. and really get to, well, besides growing, but also cooking, you know, so yeah. I would say food security was threatened because of the, because of those fast food restaurants being closed. But our food and nutrition security, because I mean, of course, those fast food restaurants, most of them are not nutritious, right? But our mm. our our um our food and nutrition security, I would say it was really it really helped us. I mean, and you know, like really being able to get these young young people, not so young people, elderly folks as well, wanting to grow their mm. own. Yeah. Nice. Oh, that, that's a, I think this is the maybe what we can call the silver lining of what what's going on around the world right now yeah so yeah. marina what, what could you yeah jump yeah. into that so i haven't started growing my own food yet but it's going to come at some point but uh what struck me in that crisis or situation is the importance i put in trustability of food um so just to mm. give you um my reality is that um i go pick uh, my fruits and veggies uh, in a fruits and vegetables shop across the corner to make it simple. And normally, you know, I pick it by myself. But because of the situation, the way it works now is that I hand a, uh, a list and then they pick the, the things for me. And then I have to wait in the street. And obviously, I could ask for the origin of things, but I don't want to be a pain. You know, there is a, a, a queue of people waiting. Um, but it's mm. really brought this this notion of knowing where my food is coming from, you know? And mm -hmm. I think in this situation where the food was available, it, it was accessible, but it's definitely more expensive. And I made the deliberate choice to go and pay the price, of course, because I'm privileged enough to afford it and I'm, and I'm extremely grateful for that. But what it brought is really that, you know, food and cooking in this situation is indeed the maybe the best entertainment that we have when everything else is closed and you can't do much uh, out there. And for me, you know, it was the way to recognize, as you were saying, the importance of food nutrition, uh, food security, uh, sorry, but also nutrition security, like the quality mm. and what the value that we put in, in food. And I think the fact that, you know, people are interested in growing their own food is also a reflection of that. I think we are sensitive about what we put in our belly, obviously, because, you know, in my case, I'm privileged enough to have this choice and this option. 
Um, and I'm thinking about those who don't have any option, basically. And that's what that's something we should take into account when we talk about what we should do in the future. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was about to ask Yemi to jump in as well, but. <laughs> I but tell us I'm about gonna... the Philippines, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so during the lockdown, uh, well, basically there was a lockdown that was put in 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 into effect sometime towards the end of uh, middle of March, and it kind of got eased up just recently, just this week. Um, but within that span of maybe almost two months, you, you you'd see that people started actually wanting to learn about how to grow their own food in their backyards. Uh, the same thing as what you guys are saying, that you know, people started to see the value of growing your own food, given that certain establishments or food establishments where they normally would have sourced their food from have actually closed up because uh, the, the, the reality being that these food establishments also rely a lot on the, the, the supposed existing food uh, supply chains. So... With with all the lockdown being restricted and trade restrictions being done in certain countries that supposedly export staples, and countries that that were very dependent on these exports started you know didn't have those food that they would normally consume. And I think that's what we were getting into. We I, there was a trend of you'd see it in within my Facebook network even that people started to grow food and you know in in recycling certain. PET bottles, just cutting them, putting soil, and then growing, hanging them. And, you know, we, we have a, a colleague from White Park Philippines who's also, uh, you know, just putting container gardening, growing vegetables out of these. And we have people from the city who take pictures about how they're now growing food. And I think the crucial thing is people are now understanding that food security is actually national security to some degree. Right. Um, and, and I think that basically answers why farm, because food security is national security. Mm -hmm. So before Yemi gets <laughs> out of the screen again, I'm going to ask Yemi to jump into this discussion. <laughs> Yemi, tell us about what is it, how, how, how the reality is there in your, in your side of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. <clears throat> Go ahead, Yemi. Yeah, so um, I will speak from two sides of my mouth. So I will speak from the side of my mouth where the experience is coming from living here in Rome in Italy. And um, <clears throat> as you all know, as you all know, the situation in Italy is a really, really big one. And um, it got yeah. really complicated. Can you all hear me? Is this still working properly? Yes, yes. Go ahead, yeah. All right, okay. So um you know one of the things that one of the things that became very uh, uh, clear to me was how much of how much truth is associated with the Italian culture of food in the sense that even when everything was um felt like everything was burning down and felt like things had really gotten worse. Um, there, we still have, we could still access food. Basically. You could go to uh, to grocery stores, you could, grocery stores, I mean, they have restrictions on how to get in and you need to wear your mask, you need to follow some particular guidance, but the food are always on the shelf, you know? The food are always there and the fresh food for that matter, fruit, uh, parceled and packed uh, food and fresh ones, ones that are processed and so on. So, so in a in a in, so in a way, I felt a bit privileged, even though it was in the middle of a pandemic. And everything felt like Rome was having. I mean, Italy generally was having the the brunt of it, but um, food was available, and everybody, to a large extent, could access it. At least from my understanding. Now, from the other side of my mouth which is what the reporter was getting from home, like family back in Nigeria and how, uh, you know, it was, there were a lot of difficulty before they could actually decide 
to have a lockdown, despite the indication that this is what is necessary. And um, so when the lockdown happened uh, for the first um, two or three days, people already were struggling to, to, to have access to either finance needed to get food, like, because income basically stopped for a lot of families. You know, mm -hmm. uh, these are economies that relies on daily sustenance and daily, uh, daily engagement to get income. So in a situation where people cannot go out to work anymore, basically that means that food security is impaired. And that means families will start to struggle before you get to day four of lockdown. So basically in some of these economies, it was uh, lockdown was impracticable. So people really couldn't have lockdown for more than 10 days. So as we speak right now, lockdown is over before it even gets started and people are back to trying to get food and trying to get their income back to stability and so on. And what actually was a bit more concerning was the, uh, was the uh, problem with, the, with supply chains for food in general, mm -hmm. because it also has a lot to do with blanket uh, policies and blanket declarations that, okay, no more movement instead of some of these movement, some of these policies that are filtered for different actors or different needs so that the system can still continue to function. So basically there was a problem with a lot of uh, uh, food, food produce getting spoiled. You know, some farmers, young farmers were really basically crying for help on Twitter, you know, with their, film pro with their, with their food products, asking people that mm -hmm. please help me share this, help me tell people if anyone needs uh, tomatoes, or if anyone needs a crate of eggs, we can do home delivery because we can't, you know, we can't move food produce anymore. Yeah. So so yeah. so some of these economies in like Africa suffered during the little period of lockdown that they had, while people like us in Rome, yeah. despite the the height of the health crisis, we were still able to access food. So it talks it talks a little bit about privilege and how the system works as well, and how mm. uh, uh, different young people can engage based on the frame that allowed them to to do so based on different yeah. arrangements across the landscape where we operate. So it's, so these two sides of the world, it's, uh, it's an interesting situation that I think will form a lot of the conversation we're going to be having today. So by the time people start to share their story, which I think people should do, so if you are listening, yeah. please let us know what is going on in the different localities, you know, what are the stories, how are people uh, trying to balance uh, the situation in terms of still, still having access to, to, to living sustenance while protecting their health issue. Because, you know, I was, yeah. I was telling, I was having a discussion with someone, I was telling them that, you know, this issue is an issue of asking people to choose between starvation and illness in a lot of the economies. Uh, it's not really, it's not really, a, it's not an easy choice to make. You know? mm. it's, it's difficult and uh, it's also, you know, brings to bear the importance of why young people like us need to find our space and our role yeah in terms of uh, getting engaged on the ground and planting the seed, and also in the, in the hands of advocating and lobbying for a framework that will allow us to actually uh, uh, have, a, have a system that works because everybody has a role to play. Because now discussion about food is going to be a political discussion. It's not just about, uh, about getting food to the belly and health alone. It's now a really, it's entrenched in political discourse. It's an issue of mm -hmm. legislation, issues of access to, 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 um, to different resources that frame how we are able to, to, to define uh, food, who has access, who yeah. doesn't, who is able to, to engage and so on. Or I'll, I'll stop yeah. there for now. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, but that, that's really interesting because we have, we have, uh, we've seen that the, the COVID-19 has basically shaken the systems that were in place around the world in, in, in terms of how we've become so comfortable maybe with, with how the things, you know, especially with how de delivery systems or logistical systems have kind of placed just-in-time systems for food to be right there at that specific time when you need it, on demand kind of thing. But, you know, I think... The COVID nineteen has brought to light maybe the the issue that there are deeper um, issues and and I think Yemi pointed out where really well where there are social and economic um, implications as well that that put the 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 less privileged into the position of 
having to choose between food and health, right? Is it food first or is it health first? And, and, and I think that shouldn't be a choice that people have to make. You know, it should be that young pe- people in b- basically need to have that right to food and right to good health. And I think that's not a choice that people should make. But the reality is this pandemic is shaking all the systems around the world and economies and health infrastructures and even the food system where we're really questioning now, are we able to achieve food and nutrition security? And it's really important to point out the nutrition aspect of things because uh, like what Yemi said, when the social implications have, have kind of like been brought out into the open, you see that people are now questioning with, with the little money that I have, should I buy food that I would normally eat or should I buy larger amounts of quantity of less nutritious food but still can, you know, keep my belly full, you know, so those become the questions. And I think we have some comments as well in the, uh, in the thread. Um, I'll go, Dax, I'll go with the first question that maybe Azam placed in. Um, so Azam said, let me put first topic in the floor. Pandemic is going on in these days, lack of labor force. Who youth volunteers can help farmers in the fields? What is your suggestions and ideas? Going out is also hard and scary because of change of the possibility of being contaminated by COVID-19. Um, Marina, Yemi, you want to jump in on first in that one? Well, I don't know if I have any clear suggestion, but just to share an experience in France. Um, so what happened is that for there was the seasonal uh, harvesting, and normally a lot of workers come from Spain, and because the borders were closed, then they had to call for workers within France. So there was actually a national call to ask for volunteers, well, not volunteers, actually, because they would be paid. Uh, and mm. there's been a lot of people responding to the call, but then it seemed that it was not as successful as, as it was expected to be, uh, because a lot of people who expressed interest were too far from where they were supposed to work. So there was still this challenge of moving, which was not possible mm. at that time. And the second issue is that a lot of people responded positively, went there, but then were not reliable. They say that it was too difficult, they uh, didn't come the next day, things like that. So uh, I guess, you know, the option of indeed sending a call out would be a solution, but maybe we need to refine the process uh, through which Mm. you send the call out, you select people, you make them maybe more aware about what it means. Uh, concretely to to work in the field uh, because it's certainly not a a workforce for everybody maybe Um, and Mm these kind of things like that like how do you ensure that they can move that they can that you can accommodate them somewhere Um, these are a lot of questions to to respond to be able to indeed facilitate Mm -hmm. uh, the volunteering in in your different uh, farming activities Mm, that's interesting pulling a putting a call out to to ask for people to volunteer and be on the farm. And I think um, that's one thing that, you, as you said rightly, that the process needs to be polished just so that we still put the right and appropriate measures for, you know, putting wall washing of hands, the distancing, uh, you know, in these kinds of situations. So it's very tricky, but there is that aspect of helping out just so that the community can achieve Food security. So, Yemi or Alpha, you want to jump in on that one as well? What are your suggestions to to address that? Dax, can we pull up the yeah? Or did Marina answer it succinctly already? Yeah, Marina did a. I feel a good job at it. Um, but if I may add, you know, yeah. like in, in our case, I would say I would give a suggestion of what we have been doing here in Trinidad. Um, mm-hmm. We have really started developing our something we call a farmer's collective, um, which is, of course, this is a model known across the world. 
And essentially, what we do is that we share markets, we share labor with each other. So let's say, you know, we are all four farmers here. You know, we choose mm -hmm. a day, all go on each other's farm and help with that, with that labor force on the farm. You know, we we'll tackle mm -hmm. a particular project, right? Um, so we have been doing that quite a lot since, since the lockdown here in Trinidad. And I've proven okay. that's well all over the island, to be honest. Um, because there were a lot of young people who I would say they now again, they really got that push to start, you know, like let me really start this, you know, the time is now. Yeah. So, and of yeah. course, when it's like a large acreage of land, you really need help, you really need support. Um, you can do it alone. Yeah, you can do it alone, you know. And sometimes <laughs> that support is more or less there's, there's motivational support as well. So I would say yeah. we share motivation, we share labor. We share markets, we share seeds, we share soil, you know, and, we, and, and, and it's sort of like a bank system then, then whatever you put in, you get out. So, you know, you, we, mm. we, we check the time that you work, that you go on someone else's farm, and we go, well, you know, the bank sort of owes you those hours or something in, something worth of that value to, to be repaid to you. It's like a loan, you know, um, but zero interest loan too. So Yeah, so, yeah. That is that is the suggestion. I mean, I I I would have some ranting to do later on in our in our session here because I would <laughs> also think that young people need more and more support. And I sure those of you listening in, you know, especially if the farmers listening on, you might definitely agree that more support mm. is needed. But you know what? Practical support, you know, not these. Not the support via paper. That that is that is that doesn't work for agriculture, you know, like practical on the ground support. But I'll save yeah, yeah. Ranting, I'll save some of that ranting for a bit later on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, good, yeah, good yeah, one. Alpha. Jump in. Yeah, good one, Alpha. Um, you know what I'm thinking right now is uh I would think from the angle of someone, for example, is an African young man. The person right now in these days will need income, for sure. Mm. It's not a time where you can, um, or where you should, from the ethical perspective, encourage people to volunteer their time for things for too much. Uh, you need to look at it from the angle of people need to eat, people need income, and these are two things that are scarce in this period, which will be scarce for a while. So if you want yeah. to design an intervention, yeah. uh, an opportunity for young people to to intervene, to, to do hands on, to contribute to the system, you have to ensure that you design a program where they, are, they get the incentive to do so. And also they have uh, uh, tangibles out of it. Like, like what uh, Alpha just said, they don't need a certificate of volunteering for this kind of stuff, no. They need Practical. maybe like a farm, maybe a basket of food from the produce where they volunteered to, 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 to you know, to contribute to planting or whatever, or some mm. kind of forms of other incentives or, or compensation or whatever. But for sure, this is an opportunity to design programs where there are opportunities for people to learn technical competencies and so on, and also to get out of, you know? The, 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 we are out of the stage of volunteer for competencies and you get a certification. An African young man don't need a certification right now. You know, they mm. need food, they need employment, they need to be able to boost of income. And I would argue that that would apply for most of the, of the other developing economies where you know, yeah, these resources yeah. are scarce. Yeah. So, so, so where if we have a program at the moment or you're thinking of doing a program or something like that, reflect on how best to engage people with the fund for them as well. Yeah. Great. Wow, those you are know, great. What, sorry, maybe I'm actually Go. too, it's coming too early in the conversation, but what strikes me is that a lot of things that we're discussing about when we talk about, you know, the need to address economical, social, and environmental needs, the fact that young, young people are struggling with unemployment are things that we have been dealing with for yeah. ages now, like years and years, and that's basically the core of why it has work. So all what we are trying to address when it comes to uh, the sustainability of food systems and the critical needs of young people actually are the same as before, but COVID-19 is amplifying it, like it's becoming really 
radical now. So I think the the big opportunity and, and positive side of this situation is that there is a, an awareness growing about the specific needs that we need, both to have a more sustainable sustainable global system and providing strong support to young people. So I'm sorry to say that maybe it's inappropriate, but that's really the exciting uh, aspect of, of this current crisis, is, is that it's it's an opportunity to, to raise our voice even more on those issues that we have been highlighted for years now. We need a more sustainable global food system, and we need to engage young people in a way that they are indeed empowered and equipped to have sustainable livelihoods. Yeah, and, and I mean, if I may just add as well to guys, like like when I think about it, the, the, the main, the two main security that folks the, around the world were concerned about when, when we got into this pandemic was one, which is a funny one, toilet paper security, and then two, uh -huh. food security. <laughs> as, the, as the toilet paper security got under control, then people <laughs> would panic about food. And then, you know, if we were to really examine... I mean, yes, I mean, across the world, there's a lot of, you know, aging farmers, but the young mm. people are the ones really on the ground as well, you know, to make this, this, this sector sustainable, right? So the young people really need that support, you know, and I saw someone ask the question, but I, I, it came off the, the screen quickly about um, youth and ags. I, well, I wasn't sure if it was someone asking, if it was um, Dax that put that there, but what, what can youth organizations do? To support these young people you know and I, I i think i think that we must of course continue lobbying you know ypad y farm you know thought for food all these great organizations continue lobbying but what yeah. is one of the practical plans that we want to put in place and let's give an example of this is developing an agri premier incubator design lab and you know our mm. acronym that is an aid lab you know, because that is the kind of aid that young people need. So an agripreneur incubator design lab, a space where young people could come and get and, and, and create a product from, from, from concept to commercialization, an agricultural yeah. product with these raw materials. Because we found in Trinidad and Tobago as well that when the pandemic hit, there were a lot of well, watermelon um, was being wasted in Trinidad. And... Um, mm. Yeah, sorry to tell you that, Yemi. I know you were having some great watermelon before, but um, <laughs> a lot of watermelon farmers were, you know, it was being wasted because they ended up like a big block, a big um, bulk on the market. And, you know, in my mind, I was like, you know, what's our watermelon industry? We don't have a watermelon industry, you know, and a lot of young people are growing watermelon. So, when they want to create a watermelon lolly, a watermelon juice, a watermelon smoothie, you know, all we do with watermelon is simply eat the watermelon, you know, I mean, I eat a lot as well, but it's like, if, if there was a space for these young people who's growing these watermelon to be able to have access to equipment and machinery, you know, a space where they get training, motivation to create these, yeah. products, you know, because again, I would always say, where does a young person find 5,000 US dollars to buy themselves a commercial um, dehydrator or a commercial food processor. It's very hard to get, you know? So this yeah. is what, what, what Y Farm is trying to, I would say, pioneer. And spaces in communities where, like making it a model, where these young folks could then create, could come in, get access to training, get access to some sort of financing as well. But in the case of having having equipment, it wouldn't be a lot of financing. Maybe that's like your packaging, for example, and get these products on the shelves, right? So, mm. I mean, for the practical things, and of course, we have been lobbying for support for doing something like this. It's really hard. Yeah. You know, I mean, at the same time, we won't stop because this will benefit so much young people. And these are the kind of practical things that, um, you know, we try to work towards. And, it's, and I guess this is the kind of practical things I would love coming out of this this this, this meeting as yeah. well. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think this is the the point of this discussion basically is to kind of bring those up in the into the space of of developmental work and discussions of policies as to what are the practical kinds of support that young people need. And I think you pointed out that the you see like what Yemi pointed out 
the, the social implications, the employment, the labor, the the immediate you know need to access basket of goods that they can consume as a young person and as a household. Maybe um, what you're saying in terms of putting those support mechanisms and basically what Marina is saying is that we've been lobbying for this for years already in, in, across different platforms. We have had the Thought for Food Challenge, we have YPOD, we have Y Farm, we have um, young people at the, at the Rome-based agencies talking about how young people need support and not just, you know, a nice looking budget on paper. Yeah but really something that's tangible on the ground that young people can feel and experience and really grasp and say that, you know, this is the kind of support that we need for us to move forward. And I think we have to adapt that towards the context of the new normal in terms of post-COVID maybe. Like, how is that going to look like? Like, say, for example, I mean, just running, just chasing the rabbit down the hole here, um, you saying, uh, Alpha, about putting up an incubator where young people can go, they have access to all the technologies, the infrastructure, or like the machines that they need to process their food whatsoever, so that they can have products that they can put on shelves. You know, how is that also going to look like in, in the, in the post COVID situation? So how do we bridge those products to the markets? Mm -hmm. And I think that's also some things for us to think about, like how can local governments, how can developmental institutions work towards putting the, necessary support mechanisms for young people to be able to access these kinds of support that you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've actually, we've actually segued to another question with that, with, with, the, with the point that Alpha was going into. Um, and, and I think this is also something that Yemi and Marina could really bring some light towards Like how can maybe YPARD and fellow youth in ag organizations kind of continue to, boost that engagement in and for agriculture and you know jumping in on that spark of interest that that young people are now seeing saying that you know it's time for us to grow food because it's important and many of us are now realizing the value of food and agriculture so what do you guys think about how young youth and ag org organizations can go and boost youth engagement can I can I step back a little bit and, and raise one of the concerns I see about the future because I think it's it's um it will help to also frame the next concrete steps. So just because what I mm -hmm. think when I think about you know scenarios for the future, uh, looking at foresight approaches and so on, I see two radical scenarios. One is my favorite, where we really understand that indeed we need something that is more sustainable, global food systems that are more sustainable, and we work towards that. Mm -hmm. The worst case scenario I see is that indeed we are going through a huge economical crisis. This, this is real. And the risk mm -hmm. is that the, the response to that is actually a very extreme capitalism model to you know fill that gap that we are going through economically so i think it's important to keep in mind these diff different scenarios because it will influence a lot the way um, policies will um, will be implemented uh, and the way you know the the mindset of the people we are going to talk with so i just wanted to highlight that to to keep that in these scenarios in mind and that we adopt the right mindset um, by mm -hmm. that, I mean, you know, the vision and the mission of White Hat, trying to really engage young people as, as actors for sustainable global food systems. Good. Sustainable meaning, yeah. you know, that we have this economically balanced, socially balanced, and, and, um, and sorry, uh, ecologically, <laughs> ecologically mm -hmm. balanced um, environment. Yes. So I think for this to, to work, to me, uh, first is to really understand the environments within which we work. Um, so that means, as we have already started to do, collecting stories of, of people, their realities, their needs, their challenges at different levels, so that we really understand what's the problem, and then we can find solutions to it. And again, talking about risk and, and worries I have is that we all jump into new uh, 
exciting, innovative projects without actually understanding what's going on. Mm -hmm. Because talking about, you know, being hopeful, I think there would be opportunities for allocated resources to respond to COVID-19, actually. I think because it's already happening. But now let's be let's be mindful about the way we are going to do that. And, and that's, yeah, sorry, my biggest fear. Like, let's step back a bit and let's understand what's going on, despite the emergency, the fact that we are indeed running out of time and, and, uh, and energies in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing is um, to keep engaging in the discussions, like the policy debates, etc., et as we've been doing already. So engaging in the different discussions that are mainly happening online, well, fully happen happening online currently. Um, mm. And then I think it's about maybe talking about, you know, the needs of people and understanding through the stories that we collect, understanding maybe the skills that they need. Uh, I think Jamie mentioned about that as well, you know, like what kind of skills do young people need in this specific context of COVID-19? It may raise, um, you know, new skills that we hadn't identified before. And then carrying on the collective action, really. I mean, WIPAD has been working as an international network with this idea that we need to uh, join forces and to work collaboratively to not reinvent the wheel, um, be smarter in the way we, we work that, so that we are more efficient and um, that our projects are, are more cost effective as well. So I think mm -hmm. it's about that. It's, it's coming together, finding solutions, writing this damn proposal, uh, mobilizing the, the money and the efforts and, and the brand uh, to do what, what we've got to do. And then I think it's about providing feedback, like showing the impact of our work so that we indeed mobilize um, uh, donors, let's say, or yeah, donors uh, on the long term, mm -hmm. you know, that they understand that what we are doing is actually making sense, that it has impact, that it, 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 it serves our, at our purpose. Uh, and so that we we make sure that we build that that strong relationship uh, for for a long time. So yeah, I guess that's it from my side. Yami, I'm sure you mm. have many things to add. <laughs> Go ahead, Yami. Actually, no. I, I actually, no. Um, I, I think <laughs> yeah, because I think what you said can also be conferred on other youth organizations or associations as well, in the sense that mm. I think one we all need to remember that uh, the way the actors out there and institutions view us is like a site of legitimacy. Like a site, is a, 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 a sort of a, an entity that confers legitimacy on a particular set of agenda, youth-related agenda. If we need to do X, Y, Z for youth, for youth in ag, then the site or the institutions that can give a sort of a legitimate content for how we should do it, what we should really focus on and so on, is us, you know? And so with that understanding, we need to engage in the sense that we need to try to, to, uh, to like you said, like Marina said, there are some specific gaps that need to be filled. One of yeah. it is the understanding that there are some people who are more vulnerable than the others. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 had affected the whole world, but it's not going to be true to say COVID-19 has affected all the same way. You know, some yeah. people have been disproportionately affected and some people will really suffer more of the brute for a longer time. For example, in India, in April alone, the, about 27 million people lost their jobs. So which means, yeah. and you know, in, so people are losing out a lot. And a lot of people, and one of my key fears is that within the last decade, there has been some advancements in the movement of youth in hand. We've, we've progressed. That's just, that's, that's, it's, 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 an, it's an obvious factual statement that people have, young people are doing more in agriculture. There are more opportunities, there are more lights shed on it. And we've, been, we've moved forward than we were. But then we might lose it. We might lose the, the, the trajectory because People may have been confronted with a lot of realities that they can handle within this period of time. Yeah, a lot of young entrepreneurs would have lost a lot of money or a lot of you know uh, startup capital and so on because of this period, and a lot of fear would creep up. And we may need to keep up with all this with this development, this evolution that is going on, to make sure that whatever we need, whatever gaps need to be filled, 
as legi as sites of legitimacy, as institutions that can confer legitimacy on key areas, key factors, we take those space, we fill those gap, we communicate those needs, we look for those people who have those stories that can, you know, they can make sure that our our agenda or what we are speaking for is better, you know, understood. And we mm -hmm. and we communicate as such. So, which is, I think that you know that affects YPAD, that relates to all other youth organizations on the ground. They should, any youth community on the ground, whenever institutions approach you, they want to hear what you think, what stories you've got, and what how things affect the group at large. Yeah. So, whichever constituency represent, try to filter our stories and come strongly to the to the to the, to the space of participation and talk about them. You know make people realize that we've progressed and we need to do more even especially now because we don't want to lose the the the, the you know the, <clears throat> the, the the speed at which we, we evolve in. yeah so i didn't really have wow. too much more oh, see? Oh, i see i dropped out <laughs> <laughs> yeah but Sorry, i think maybe, those are really good points yeah but, maybe yes, something like maybe more concrete, I think it's um, the added value of um, the digital world, you know, when we are trying to physically distance ourselves, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it brings a big opportunity when it comes to digital services, be it from farmers to ex extension services or from farmers uh, to marketers or marketers to consumers, I mean, whatever other actors, there are opportunities for more, yeah, as I was saying, digital services. And well, we all know that young people tend to be more ICT savvy, uh, or particularly ICT savvy. So there is an opportunity, an opportunity there because there would be a niche there and that is to be filled. So that's um, something maybe mm -hmm. to, to consider as well. So that's one intersection between agriculture and uh and the digital world where young people can come in very strongly because of the the tendency for young people to be tech savvy yeah yeah and i think that i think what what you guys are saying in terms of how you, how youth and youth organizations engaged in agriculture can move forward is really kind of like calling those who need to be called accountable for uh, in terms of the policies that need uh, to be established so that young people are supported in what they do in agriculture. And I think that's what young people need to be reminded of, that you actually have the power to to call and you have the right to call those in power to say that, you, hey, you, there is a responsibility to some degree that these support mechanisms must be in place so that there is there is a sustainable development in agriculture. There is the, the path towards sustainable food systems. And, you know, speaking of policies and development work, I'm, I'm glad to see that I think a while ago there was, uh, I think I saw on, this, on the stream the, the CIRCA director, the Southeast Asian um, Graduate Research Center for Agriculture uh, director was on the, the show for, uh, I think, in the earlier part. So I'm not sure if Sir Glenn is still here. Sir, this is, if you're hearing all of these suggestions from, from Yemi, from Marina and Alpha, these are, this would fit definitely well into whatever you're planning for youth in agriculture. YPARD is very much willing to help with that. And I think that's where YPARD and contemporary organizations actually have that niche, that there is that legitimacy that Yemi was speaking about, where we can actually lobby in behalf for young people and say that this is what young people need. These are the practical things that we need. These are the policies that we need. These are the, the employment skills that need to be developed. These are the basic skills that young people need to learn, um, quote unquote, life skills. You know, it's not really soft skills that what others would say. It's really more of life skills that young people need to get access to uh, in terms of how they can build and develop themselves. And I think we've already answered another question in, throughout this discussion. And, and that discussion was, how would the dynamics of engaging young people be in terms of business? That's what Alpha actually raised. And um, there was a discussion on policy already, which 
which you guys actually put out what are the practical ways for policies to support young people. And I think one, one aspect is the, the academe and the research side of things, or, or also the extension side of things. Like, mm. how, do we, how do we engage the academia, the research, and the extension institutions so that young people are able to still access the necessarily, te- I don't know, call it what, the research technologies, knowledge, or e- access to equipment maybe for, for development of further um, varieties or whatsoever. I mean, how, how would you guys look at that kind of um, lens? How do we engage those research institutions? academe and extension for, for young people? So I, I think one, one aspect that strikes me, <laughs> sorry, I'm speaking too much. Go ahead, go <laughs> ahead, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I think Yemi and I mentioned about skills. I think that's something where the academia could have some really like built uh, strong researches on what are the skills needed uh, by young people in the context of COVID-19. But just on the hypothesis that it, it brings um, the necessity for new skills, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe it's, it's important to actually ask the question and find out, you know, if there are indeed some skills that, uh, that they would need. Uh, and looking at the broader picture, I'm sure um, they could also help, as I was saying, understanding the realities, like mm. fully understanding what it means to be a young person at a time of COVID-19 when it comes to the needs, the challenges, the solutions that they see for themselves, um, the aspirations as well. So, you know, we are doing that in a way or another school calls um, in the context of, of, of some specific projects, but I would actually see a well-grounded research being done on that specific topic. I think it's, it would be really worth it. Because COVID-19 is not happening just now. Actually, we're talking about co- post-COVID, but yes. when will we be mm. posterior to that time, you know? Like, I think we're still going to, I mean, uh, the world is going to suffer for, for quite a while, unfortunately. Sorry to be pessimistic yeah. here, but. Yeah. Mm. So, so that direction is the, the direction of the discussion on post COVID is really kind of long term looking, um, and and not just and, and kind of taking stock of what's going on now, and how that what are the implications, two years, three years, maybe down the road, uh, on how we engage young people. Um, yeah, that's very yeah. that's yeah. very true. Alpha, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I simply think that um, research institutions, academic institutions, universities, they need to be real, right? And I'll tell you why I say this, right? So pre, well, you know, before COVID-19, we had a, a relationship with an with institution to sort of do some training with us, a foreign institution to come to Trinidad to do some training with us and some other organizations. And... Um, of course, that got on hold because COVID-19 came and the world is in a panic state, right? During COVID-19 now, like a few weeks ago, maybe last week, I get a call to find out if we could, if they could do some training with us, uh, some webinar trainings. And, um, and my answer to them is no, like what webinar trainings on what, you know, like things like record keeping and things like, um, you know, tra- tracking your whatever whatever like like really nothing's right now you understand because it's like h- how am i going to take some of my colleagues at y farm some of my other partners to come and do some training on 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 bookkeeping within this period where people are going crazy people are wondering where they're going to get food where farmers are trying to get seeds like be real yeah. like like come on like come on like what is that about at the moment right now no that is the wrong place and time so it goes back to understanding the needs of, of young people now, understanding the needs of organizations now. I mean, we are interested in, I, I said to them, hey, whatever money you're going to take to do that training because you're going to hire some big consultant to do that training with us who apparently we don't know how to record keep. Um, 
send me that money or buy us a dehydrator, send me that dehydrator. You know, like this is real. <laughs> This is real. Let's let's save some of these fruits. Let's create some packages. Let's get young people who doesn't want to necessarily go in the field and farm. That doesn't mean that they don't want to be in agriculture. Let's get them to mm. put something in a pack and sell that. You understand? To create a better sustainable livelihood, to create an income. And these are the kind mm. of things that I would argue about. And like, how could in this time in here, we take time off of the farm what people want food, people want fresh food, people are concerned about that to sit online. I'm not saying those things are not important, but it's always about place and time. You know, so a lot of people, a lot of those institutions, they miss the boat. And I'm going to give, so I guess I'm starting with my ranting now, right? <laughs> I'm going to give another example too. When, when, the pandemic, when the pandemic first hit, we created a model, right? My projects officer at wife, I'm created a model to bring in 2,000 ducks, uh, ducklings from a neighboring I, um, island in the Caribbean, in Suriname. I called up all these large agencies, all these large agencies to, to support us with that. You know, we wanted to support, I believe it was 10 young people and give each give them 200 ducks to start a duck farm so that we have duck meat. Right? You guys know what is duck, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Alpha. Are you? It's good. Yeah, and, and it's that is like the hardest thing ever. We still. Oh no! His his ranting is being cut off. I <laughs> know. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I did not. I did not mean to do that. <laughs> just happened. I was just about to call Dax into the show because we're already we're we're on the way towards the end of the show already. Um, and I think uh, we we have some questions on the um, in the comment thread. And and just like we said, we want this to be an interactive discussion. Um, there yeah. are comments saying that there are lots of young people, like even from India. Um, hi Mahesh, you, you posted this. Um, Mahesh posted that there are many young people who are actually leaving the urban areas and going to the countryside. So what are they yeah. going to do? You know? So those are the, the realities. Hey Alpha, mm -hmm. nice to have you back. <laughs> I did not get yes, you up, I think, bro. I think I, I started getting really teamed up there and someone cut me off. The, I did not. The I promise you. Oh my. <laughs> Somebody Somebody saying something that I'm not supposed to say. <laughs> I think Pius has a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but be before we jump into Pius' question, Alpha, maybe you could spend one more minute just to finish off what, what you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just saying, like, you know, practical approaches, you know, we wanted to, uh, no, I'm, we weren't asking these organizations, institutions, governmental organizations as well. Mm -hmm give us any money we just want support to, to to import these ducks right there's and then when you a young person to go through all that in a time of crisis to me the world is in a pandemic so all these red tapes and all these laws has to change because the world has now changed you, you know people are dying you know sorry to say that but it's, it's the reality and we now trying to get the, those ducks and guess what we still couldn't get those ducks we literally had to just get them ourselves locally and we are still waiting and it's, it's just so much a to z red tape in order to just simply import two thousand ducks to give the 10 young persons to start them up with each with a, with, a, with a mini duck farm and these are the kind of impracticality that i advocate against and it's it's horrible and it's embarrassing to be honest but yet still yet still we have all these institutions who's on a webinar call every week talking about youth and food security. They're on a webinar yeah. every day. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And I'm like, I'm telling you what to do, but yet still you're telling me, I don't know what you're telling me. This one is telling me to talk to this one. Talk to that one. Talk to that one. And it's, it's embarrassing, to be very honest. I'm, I'm ashamed of a lot of these organizations, and I think they need to do more. Okay, you guys go on. <laughs> Somebody commented, poor Alpha. But I actually understand. I, I, 
<laughs> we got you. Her her no, she, she knows the trouble. She knows. She knows. She knows the the, the, the struggle in the Caribbean. You know. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, real. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not telling no no lie. But I think I think what you're saying is actually reality in a lot of um, countries, especially maybe I could even say in in developing in countries, the developing economies where there's a lot of red tape and, and us young people who just want to do, do, do and get things done and get solutions done, kind of like find ourselves in, in how do we navigate through the, all these red tape? You know, if we just want practical solutions, how do we find ourselves getting the right solutions to the young people who need it the most just so that they have food to eat? Um, and I, I understand the struggle, maybe to some degree, what Alpha is saying, uh, <laughs> and I and I think that that's something for us to navigate through. And I, it's just for us to, uh, how do we motivate each other, stay strong, and say, come on, let's still continue our our work and and still continue lobbying for for young people's support. All right, let's jump into the questions from the comment thread now. Um, there was a question from Pius. Uh, thanks, Pius, for coordinating also for the YPART Facebook page uh, stream and sharing this out to the YPART group. Thank you very much. So Pius's question is, what are the simple lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic that young people can equip themselves with to be prepared for any foreshadowed disruption in the global food system? Whew, that was a mouthful, but very, very important question Dax we haven't heard from you maybe yeah. maybe you can jump in on that Dax that, that, that's it, that's oh, wow. it. well wait wait to bring me into the fire gym but okay. <laughs> <laughs> what are the simple lessons? well for me I think um, with the pandemic and <laughs> everything that we're seeing globally I think that the, the most simple lesson that we have learned is the importance of food the importance of where it comes from, how it is produced. Uh, let me take off my headset because I'm hearing myself. So the importance of of producing food and getting it from the the farm to you to your plate, um, and the challenges that um, the, that food, that particular piece of food, encounters before it even gets to you. So I think that's the biggest lesson that everybody can learn, especially the youth. Um, to appreciate um, global food systems, how it works, the supply chain, the production, the production chain, and I think with the increased appreciation, um, people will, will be start will start to be more conscious about how they they consume things, how how, how their diet mm. um, is constituted right now. What what food do they need? Um, what are the their immediate needs? And I think. Um, Th this crisis has, like Marina said, has brought um, issues to the forefront that were previously um, shunned or at the back of people's minds. It's not really in front. And now um, I think that um, food, food security has been brought um, into a, a bigger stage along with um, the health system. And I think that, th that these are the things that um, we have learned as, as, a, as a planet. Yeah. Mm. True, true. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. you want to jump in on I that? think, um, you know, from my hand, I was, you know, every time I go on Twitter and uh, every time I read something about, you know, a young agriculture is somewhere, it's usually related to someone being stuck, you know, someone having limited resources to navigate the complexity that COVID-19 has brought into the, an already uh, not too strong system in the sense that uh, I see the opportunity for young people to, to to go into joint ventures rather than work solo, you know, because I realize that what we would need moving forward, a lot of people would need to come together and, you know, bring in ideas and see how they can so, and, and you know, bring resources together. So, because resources are limited, and to be frank, it's going to be continually limited for a while. Resources are not, you know. So, some people will need to talk to the two days, we need to see what is happening. And I think a lot of young people can learn from that to 
um, explore possibilities and co you know co funding co resources to develop uh, to develop what is already about to die. So that that's one key thing that I think uh, the COVID nineteen is teaching us. We we cannot work alone much longer as we used to. Because, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that brings us to yeah. SDG seventeen. <laughs> Multi stakeholder <laughs> partnerships. <laughs> it yes. really puts into forefront how public, private, civil society, young people can work together yeah. to achieve sustainable food systems. Okay, so we have a couple more minutes and we might go over a bit, just a couple a bit more. We we wanna mm. highlight some of the questions or comments from the thread. Um, Munir says, a lot of kids are stuck in their homes right now. How do we take this opportunity of bringing knowledge and agriculture to these kids and inspire them to better appreciate the value of food and farming? Um, first of all, let them hear this web discussion. I think that's a good first step. <laughs> that's right. The next step would be, I think Alpha would, would have... That's the, the, Y Farm. Y Farm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I love the question. Um, to be very honest, and I guess this is where I will jump into yeah, exactly. So one of the initiatives that this we, is Y Farm's role right there. Where is he? Yeah, you guys hearing me, right? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah great. You know, like like Monir, let why not create a challenge for these kids? You know, while they are at home, and you know the fast food restaurants may be closed. Some of their favorite foods, you know, the McDonald's might be closed. Why not create a challenge for these young people where they could plant their plates? Like plant what it is they want to consume on their plate. And this is one of the big things that I've been, you know, longing to mention on this webinar. What we have started here in Trinidad as well is like a plant your plate movement. Well, mm. I say plant your plate. So that's that you guys know. I always share my dialect and my thwang. Um, you know, so in Trinidad, how we how we might say, how how you well, how, sorry, how you guys would say you, we might just say you, you know, and that is some of our dialects. So learn that, guys. So we say plant your plate, right? Which essentially means grow the things that you want to consume on your plate. Um, Dax, could you put the Y U H? It's very important. <laughs> y U H. Yeah. Oh, okay. Plant your plate. Well, hang on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, want to know. I want the world to literally know. Plant your plate, right? Um, there so, you go. So, yes. Yeah, so thank you so much. So, Monir, like we could then create this challenge, a plant your plate challenge, where these kids are now growing, you know, the food that they want to consume. And, and, and you know what is the challenge, really? When they, let's say in six weeks' time, when they are, you know, having a meal, they could then say that, hey, let's see who has the greatest percentage of things that was planted in their backyard on their plate. You know, so it's like, I, you can now say that 33% of things on my plate, I planted it. 20% of the mm. things on my plate, I planted it. And this would allow for a greater appreciation of growing their own food. You know, and one of the things that I, I, would, I could see in, let's say, 15 years' time, God spare my life, I want children to be able to say, you know, during that pandemic, during that crisis in the year 2020, I grew some celery, I grew some patch I grew some lettuce, and that caused us to eat during COVID-19. And guess what? They now mm. know the answer why farm. Now, many of these children, they may go on to become doctors, lawyers, you name it. We need all of that, engineers, pilots. But as we always yeah. say, everyone must know the answer to why farm. And we now have the perfect opportunity to get these children to understand the why. You know, this must under this must allow them to understand the why. So again, to Munir and all your kids. And by the way, Munir is doing an amazing program in his end of the world. Really, really awesome um, stuff that he's doing over there. So I want everyone to be able to plant your plate. Yeah, it's not too late. Okay, guys. So there's a challenge being directed right now to the viewers. And I think that's a challenge that maybe Y-Part can even bring on and 
Uh-huh. Let's make that Planting challenge plate. a global challenge. Plant your plate challenge. Yeah. I'm sure Pius is listening. Hashtag plant your plate, Pius. <laughs> go ahead, Pius. <laughs> You're giving a go signal already. <laughs> it's not too late. Let's do this, guys. Let's do it. Oh, I, I'm just waiting for those for those uh, spoken poetry of alphas. We'll, yeah. we'll probably give him some time in a while. Yeah, let me know when you're ready, All man. Right. I'm ready to heat it up, you know? You know, I'm always ready, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll take two more, maybe, from the comments and before we wrap up. Um, do you, did you find anything else there, Dax? I think um, we have Justin, who's also oh. from White Bard, Philippines. He's, he shared something about his NGO that he's part of. Uh, so he said, yeah. uh, our NGO, I am Hampas Lupa Ecological Agriculture Movement, attempts to connect food production, nutrition, and climate through massive open online capacity building opportunities. The nature of the organization is campaigning. We're leveling up to actually realize efforts so we can even monitor improvements, work, do, do's right before our eyes. Mm -hmm. So I know even for, for a fact that um, his organization is working with local government units and other organizations to give seeds to people who want to grow food in their backyard. So those are things that young people can do um, and could do even post COVID, like, you know, organize these things and those those uh, uh planting in the backyards and plant your plate you know so we're gonna have to make that a hashtag plant your plate okay so white part bangladesh is catching it already um so <laughs> this is gonna spread like wildfire alpha yeah um, your plate. this is gonna go around white part global anytime soon plant your plate let's do it and we have to say it in the trinidad and tobago twang it's important yeah. plant your plate <laughs> <laughs> You got it down, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's Trini. He's a, a Trini now. <laughs> okay. Did you find anything else, Dax, that we could highlight? I think this one is also okay. a good question. Is this a good question for us to wrap up with? Let, let's do this. How do you think the concept grow local, eat local will work in post-COVID situation and what youth organizations can do for that? Well, let Feel me free to jump in. Yeah, let me dive in because I've been I had this final point that I really needed to say as well. Sorry for grabbing right. you guys. Um, go ahead. I, we must use poem. And what is poem, right? It's an acronym, you know. You know, we uh -huh. like poems. you know, it stands yes. for prioritize, organize, energize, and mobilize. You remember that, guys? Poem, right? And uh, you know, we must prioritize the, the needs of the youth. You know, as youth organizations, you know, I'm starting starting with myself and with, with my leadership at Y Farm. We must prioritize the needs of the youth. We, we can't continue to make the same mistakes that our seniors been making. They have been they have been always. I, this is from my experience. A lot of a lot of senior folks who I who I interact with on a day to day basis, you know, they still think as though they are 20 and 30 years old, and so much things have changed from since that time. Right when they were 20 and 30, 20 years ago, right? So they think they know the needs of the youth and they don't. So we must prioritize the needs of the youth. Then we must organize these needs as well and get these young people, these young farmers, these young entrepreneurs organized. And then we must energize them, right? Because it's important. Mm. And that energize, it speaks to motivation. It speaks to, to, to inspiration. And then we must mobilize them, right? mobilize them in the yeah. sense that you know organize organize what they grow we can't have every young person that's growing cucumber or or, or or watermelon you know we must organize and we must mobilize them in a way that we could collectively create a crop or different crops to create a product or several products so again poem prioritize organize energize and mobilize this this is what i'm trying to take the lead on doing and I, you know, I encourage others to do the same. Yeah. Prioritize, organize, energize, mobilize. There we go. Go plant your plate. Yeah. Perfect. Yemi Alpha or Yemi Marina and Dax. Uh, let's start with Marina. 
I'm not sure I have anything to add after such a nice one. <laughs> Prioritize, organize, energize, mobilize. Yemi dropped off. Did he? Uh, yeah. yeah he did. Just let me do a shout out uh, at young, young women who may be following our conversation. If you have any questions or you know comments you want to raise, please feel free. I'm feeling alone here. Yeah, <laughs> we, we have we have people who are we have fellow young women on the on the comment thread. Uh, yeah, yeah, they did they did contribute, but more with comments and not further questions or you know. <laughs> yes, we need some more. We need some more gender empowerment in the comment thread. Yeah, we need some more farm hers. Farm hers. <laughs> oh, that's witty right there. <laughs> Alpha never runs out of all these things. <laughs> Go ahead, Yummy. What do you have? We love you. What do you have to say? Um, I think I can be starting the conversation a little bit. Um, so, well, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, what I found pretty much uh, I've recovered. You talked about it a lot, and um, what we really need to do is to, you know, when we identify good practices, we we share success stories of those who had used it, who had done it, and you know, so that we can make sure that everybody else can learn from them and resources that are needed to scale up some of these uh, practices, we can also advocate for them. And uh, we can advocate for resources to support that. That could be political resources, that could be investment resources, that could be learning capacities, resources, whatever there is. But we need to, you know, know them. When we know them, we, when, when we identify them, we can share this, this um, these ways of doing, doing things. And also to understand that increasingly, People will begin to, people will be forced and compelled to try out new ways of getting food. <clears throat> Which means, you know, when you're desperate, you grab on whatever is possible. So for, mm -hmm. for us to push good practices, it might be a bit difficult, but also empathize on why people may not be able to follow a particular routine and, and sort of interrogate what are the ways by which people can still meet their needs and also can we still achieve sustainable food practices. So it's local, you know, plant local or, you know, whatever slogan we choose to use, whichever practice we choose to put forward, we should always remember that, you know, it may not work across the scale and to understand the reason why it may be so. And, you know, let's, and also make people feel that uh, if they are stuck, there are reasons uh, that we empathize, we understand. We know what it's like, and and to, basically, we, we our our role is to balance the view. Our role is to advocate for everybody, not just some people. And our role is to, yes. you know, to identify our privilege, to identify our privilege, know what those privilege are, and and also be able to to interact with those who may not share those privilege, and be able to advocate for what is needed, such that we can also you know come to par with whatever sustainable practice we are pushing for. So that would be the role of yeah. this organization. Yes. Well said. Well yep. said. Hmm. Marina Dax. I, I would just say, if it's the word of the end, I would just say, keep on uh, sharing your stories, uh, tell your realities, your, your needs, your challenges, your, the, your aspirations, as I was saying, the solutions that you see for yourself. Um, join forces with, with your peers and don't hesitate also to talk to decision, to decision makers, potential partners. It's really the time to connect the dots, I mean, more than ever. So. Mm. Yeah, let's just do that. Let's keep in touch. Let's let's work together. Yeah. Mm. Dax, last words and answer to the question of Azam. <laughs> last again, words and Jim. question to Azam. I was just saying any statements towards to, to wrap up and also maybe oh. to answer also what Azam was asking. Okay, so let me take it off again. 
All right, so um, uh, with the plant your plate and um, growing local and eating local, these, these two challenges, I think, are on a collision course. And I think that um, with the increased awareness now about um, food systems in general, because as brought upon by this crisis, I think that um, YPARD and other youth organizations in agriculture are in a, are in a prime spot to bring out and bring forth um, the solutions that they have. And I think that uh, my only hope is that um, governments around the world, organizations, will also listen and will also um, heed um, the voice of the youth in these mm. talks. Because um, um, no matter how we cut it, um, we are next. We are next in line and we are, we are, we are going to be the next um, caretakers of our planet. We are the next caretakers of our of our um, races, of our of our society, and we need a voice. We need a we need representation in the, in these um, important and paradigm shifting issues. And uh, I think that um, this this forum, this this talk, has brought to the forefront the voices and the, the insights and the thoughts of the youth, uh, such as Alpha, Yemi, and Marina, and Jim. And I think this is um, I think this should just be the start. And I think that um, we should continue. Um, campaigning, and we should continue bringing awareness to the to the issues, and um, we should have a uh, bolder voices, louder voices in these arenas. Jim, mm. great. So, I think this is. Are you guys satisfied with how this discussion has turned out? Uh, it's actually, I like how we've not followed the guide questions step by step. Because we are disruptive. You disruptive. No, we did not. Youth are disruptive. No, we did not. We are disruptive. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So I like how we stuck to the core principle that we want this to be interactive. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. We, we have lots of comments on the thread, and uh, but I'm sure uh, I'd like to say to the viewers that we are way past, we were a quarter past the, 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 the time allo allocated supposedly for this. Uh, we have one comment. Thank you for introducing me to the concept of plant your plate. I want to know more. How can I help to spread the concept? Hope <laughs> to receive more info about it. So why don't you go to Y Farm or send a message to Alpha Senan right here? Um, and you can communicate, get in touch with him. Um, and I, I'm sure, I'm sure this is gonna be on Y part, anyways. The plant your plate challenge is that is that yeah. is that going to be there, Yemi? Yeah, yeah. Pius is over there. He's listening. <laughs> we will talk with Y Farm. <laughs> so yeah. I, I'm very happy to also see. I'm very happy to see that we have people from developmental organizations coming in, um, key people actually from financial institutions. And I see some some people like there um, right in the comment thread. And I think these are the kinds of discussions that we hope the platforms where young can young people can share their ideas, can share yeah. what are the practical ways to support young people, especially in this kinds of situation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So Marina actually <clears throat> asked for Marina asked for a lady to be highlighted. Uh, we we have somebody in the comment thread, Dax Priscilla. Uh, she said, "I have watched one vlogger, the country officials where he is right now, encourages their people to plant veggies, etc., by renting special garden places near the community and farm lots too, so those who don't own big spaces can still grow their own crops." Absolutely. That's one thing that we can do. Yeah. Well, we can use the power of digital uh, technology, do mm. vlogging, start a campaign, um, and mm. be what we just showed you in this discussion, be disruptive. Yeah. We disrupted our That's own cool. program anyways. Cool. So <laughs> and you know, there's a lot of models. Go ahead, Yemi. Yemi, go ahead. I just got very excited, you know, uh, because there are some, there are a lot of models that work. 
Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So, guys, what Dax and I normally do in our talks and webinars, we normally give <laughs> people, the guests and speakers, the opportunity to do a shout out to people who they want to yeah. shout out to on to the greet screen. People. Greet people, do a shout out whatsoever. You're free to do that right now as well. Um, who wants to go first? <laughs> yeah. Just maybe people well, who you want to greet. Yeah. A big shout out to the all to the world wipeout community, obviously. You know, like uh, yes. big thanks to you all, and again, like uh, share your stories, get involved. We love you. Yes. Shout out to Wipeout. Wipeout. <laughs> Yummy. Yeah. <laughs> shout out to everybody. Wipeout. Wipeout team. Shout out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And to all financial heavyweight and all heavyweight institutions that have representatives that are watching. Let's pop now, all right? Let's do cool things together. We're waiting. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Alpha. Okay. Yeah. Before I let you greet, before I let you greet anybody, I'm really gonna ask you this: Do a very short, whatever rap that you normally do, for yeah. the benefit of our viewers. <laughs> uh, okay, you guys ready? You ready? Yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Why farm? You say if you could, you should. Why farm today if you don't? Who would? Why farm do play? The earth need food. Why farm? I say silver, greater good. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We need to have a Go ahead, do your shout challenge. Out. Yes. We need to have a frapping challenge. You know, yes. The farmers who are rapping, <laughs> frapping challenge. Yes, I just know that. Rapping give me maize, farming. give me maize, give me maize, give me rice. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to wrap up, guys. Yemi got some bars. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Alpha. Do your shout out, and, I'll, and then I'll wrap up. I wanna, I wanna give a shout out, um, you know, to all the um folks who are who are on the chat asking about the plant, the plant your plate, and how could they get involved and whatnot. Um, and all the folks who are already on our plant your plate movement, we created it as a WhatsApp group. Um, yeah, Josine, thank you. Yeah, so really and truly, <laughs> also. I want to really give a special shout out to those institutional folks who may have joined in um, and give a little message. You know, like, as I said before, be real. Let's, let's, be, let's be real. This is a serious time. And let's not just think about the, the normal ways in which you do things where you invite some young people to a conference and you speak and you go back home, you stay in a nice hotel, get some nice food. No, things are changing. People... <laughs> <laughs> when a young person do that, he keeps away from the farm for maybe a week or more, and his farm is in problems. We, we want some practical changes on the ground. We need some sort of, um, I mean, I'm sorry to go on again, but we need some sort of collective support to really be able to not just help Alpha or to help Jim, you know, but to really help organizations to, who have the capacity to help large groups of young people. You know, so that's my shout out. I hope it's not a, a argument. I sorry to change the shout out. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Great. So I'd like to thank all the viewers who've been there. I'd like to thank Marina, uh, Yemi, Alpha to take for giving their, you know, giving us time to to have you here in this webinar. Um, this has been a discussion that's been in in preparation for two or three weeks. Of us just saying, is, is, this, is this pushing through or not? Or how are we going to go about this? <laughs> but we're finally here. And uh, thanks. Huge shout out to Dream Agritech for helping us give us this platform to, to hold this webinar. So Dax is also a member of YPARD Philippines, but his company has created a section uh, under their consultancy services that does training, yeah. extension, and hosting called Dream AgriMedia, and this is, this is what it is. Uh, this is what <laughs> Dream AgriMedia does. So huge shout out to Dax. Thanks for partnering with us for this. Before we go, uh, I just want to give a huge shout out to Yemi's internet, and uh, he has been able to stay. <laughs> yeah. 
he's been able to say during the discussion. Yeah, it's, he's the real MVP of this uh, forum. Yeah, I agree. I know. Yeah, I receive true. it. True, true, true. So, so, thank you everyone for tuning oh, in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Pius, for also coordinating for the Y Part Facebook page uh, to Yay, share the Pius. screen. Go, Pius. Uh, thank yeah. you to the Y Part team, the country representatives, the members who've tuned in and engaged Go, on the common thread. <laughs> I hope this is not the last, the first and last, but I hope this is the start of the first of many mm-hmm. uh, of how yeah. we can continue to raise the voices of young people to, to say that young people have ideas. We are worth listening to. Yes. We have the right to also be a key and active actor in the agri-food system to achieve sustainable food systems as what Marina kept driving at. So with, with that, thank you very much, guys. We are wrapping this up. See you in the next one. See you, guys. Cheers. Bye. Thanks. You're amazing. Bye. Bye.